Hi, my name is Brett from Blue Altitude. Today I'm going to give you a short presentation and I'm going to talk about the differences between the part M regulation and the part Jamo regulation. So what is new and what's different? Well, if you're familiar with the part M regulation, within that the structure of the context is built, up, built around what we call subparts. So on the part camo, there are no longer subparts for reference. However, what you do need to understand is that in applying the part camo regulation itself, there is a requirement to refer back to certain sections of the part M regulation. For example, items to do with what we call continuing airworths, which is subpart C or sections of subpart C, and also subpart I, which is to do with the airworthiness review and the airworthiness review certificate and so on. What is new and, and quite unique to this regulation is we now have what we call a clear set of definitions and you will find them at the beginning of the, of the regulation itself, of the beginning of part camo regulation. If you look, actually look at that or download it from the ERC website. The other significant change is we're now talking about or we're now looking at performance. So this really supports the competent authorities approach in having a more effective what we call performance-based oversight or performance-based risk-based uh, risk risk-based regulation. So we need to think about things differently in how we measure our performance as an organisation in having that approval and also maybe thinking about how we continually improve because that was a gap from the part A regulation, there was no real mechanism to drive change and monitor change or way to drive performance and measure performance. So part camo, with the new change of that regulation, structure and context, it definitely drives and makes you think things differently within your own organisation. Another significant change is what we call alt box, so an alternative means of compliance. So that's really where in the regulatory structure, we have implementing regulations, and then we have acceptable means of compliance and in general guidance material. So the acceptable means of compliance is where we can apply to the competent authority and have a different mechanism to meet that requirement in order to meet the intention of the implementing regulation. And we call them, or they're classified as, as, as alternative means of compliance. And as I can just confirm, they need to be approved by the competent authority and they form a basis as your approval. Next, we need to think about this safety risk management system. So that really is a, a complete different change now to what the part M regulation required. So we need to think about risks, we need to identify our hazards, we need to think about maybe the management of change and how we manage change, safety promotion, the emergency response plan, and all that sort of good stuff are associated with the safety risk management system. And that can be quite complicated. But however, it needs to be based on this, the size of your organisation. So it's really it's customised to how you do your own business. The additional, uh, another significant change is the what we call the personnel. So you may find some organisations may already have a safety manager, and you may already find you have a compliance manager manager. But now it's been clearly found within the relation you need a safety manager and a compliance monitoring manager. Dependent on the scale and size of the organisation, that can be held, or that both those roles could be held by the same individual. However, that needs to be approved by the competent authority. We also need to think about what we call this new way of looking at stuff is in the sense of like a current reporting. So your organisation may already do a current reporting, which is brilliant if you do that already, but if it's new to you, the way that sits that now sits under what we call the internal safety reporting scheme. So we need to think about how we actually report things within our uh, within our organisation. We need to think about how we learn things now, because that's now linked back to our safety risk management system, and also applying what we call the just culture principles. That's a huge change within what we did from part ten. And also, we now have what we call like a safety policy, and that just culture aspect feeds in to that safety policy and the objectives around that aspect. Next, we have an occurrence reporting system. So we need to be able to think about how we classify near misses, as well as, uh, sorry, near misses and uh, 
mandatory requirements. So under the Corporate Authority and maybe under EASA, there are mandatory requirements to what we consider as, as a reportable event. Yet again, we may identify other things that we consider to be a reportable event. So the important thing to remember on this aspect is we just don't need to, we, shall we, we must report on the mandatory items. Yes, we may have voluntary reporting, but we shouldn't just limit it to the, the, what the what we consider to be the mandatory requirements. We need to think more laterally and think about other things that may affect the organisation that we should report on. What's also new and really clearly defined now is what we call the competency assessment. So everybody within the organisation, within the, on the park channel, needs to have some form of competency assessment. And again, you need to structure that, and that's applicable to both uh, what we call permanent staff and also contract staff. And also we need to think about how we actually monitor people when they're still under being assessed as a form of competency, i.e. they're being under supervision. So we need to maybe demonstrate that. Another thing that maybe has changed is how we actually classify the findings. Now in, the, in part M, we have like a level one, level two. Likewise, in part camo, we have a level one and level two. But in the part M, it was clearly defined what we classify as a significant event. Maybe something like level two would be something that could, could or lowers the safety standard. Here, there is definitely a different change. And they've actually listed within the regulation what they classify as a level one requirement. So what you would find in like part M, for example, it was a bit, it really didn't define what would be considered to be a level one. However, on the part camo, it does. You have a clear definition of terms what they would classify as a level one finding. I'll, I'd just like to bring to your attention really uh, under like camo.b.350, which is the competent authority in relation to the, how they would issue findings, if that's the case. They would issue a finding for malpractice or fraudulent use of the certificate. So that's something new. And you won't find a terminology of like malpractice or fraudulent use of certificate anywhere else within the regulations under continued air awareness that is. Again, lack of account of manager, if you falsify or falsification of records. So again, the only time I've ever seen that terminology being used is in relation to the Federal Aviation Administration, sort of, uh, the FAA that is, where they talk about falsification of records. So it's the first time I think it's being used under a continued air uh, regulation aspect. And likewise, you can see here, access to the facility, that would also be considered to be a level one finding. The new change or the new link now, again, link to our performance and continuous improvement, you'll see here we need to think about our root cause uh, corrective action or RCA. So again, link to our corrective action plan, we need to implement that and obviously send it off to the uh, competent authority so when we resolve the, these uh, RCCA or RCA issues, therefore the corporate authority accept and close out on our findings. There's also a greater oversight of what we call the subcontractors and the contractors. So the subcontractors are people or organisations who are working under our quality system. So as an example, Flow Altitude is, has an part camo approval, therefore we may delegate some of those responsibilities that we have to a third party, that's a subcontracted sub organisation. And there's a whole ream of regulation and understanding how that actually works, which we do cover and will cover in another session. However, what's important about that is that uh, they will obviously work under our sort of uh, oversight or active control, there's another way to think about it. Again, the next one is when we talk about contractors, that's the contract of maintenance organisations, which is very similar to how we would do things under Part M. Likewise, within this regulation, we need to think about the risks. So if we're doing that and we're actually delegating out some of those tasks and having some sort of oversight, then we need to think about the risks. And that really supports our safety risk management system. Next bit is the with reference to the top part M, which I've already covered at the beginning, but just to clarify, under part camo, we need to refer back to subpart C and subpart I. And that's really to help us to try and 
maintain what we call the continuing awareness aspects. So we we'll talk about AD analysis, aircraft maintenance programs, we're talking about modifications and repairs as an example. The game itself, the next sort of change, has been slightly restructured and content's been added. So your cane would not be will not look like the previous uh, part M cane. It needs to be restructured and reworked. Next we have our training requirements. So under part M, the only manual training, uh, sorry, mandatory training we had to do was all to do in relation to fuel tank safety, which I've just highlighted now on the diagram. Under part camo, there's a, a significant increase in the training requirements that are now mandatory. And so for everybody within the organization, we need to think about safety training, both initial and refresher. We need to think about human factors, again, initial and refresher, if you're not already doing it. Competency assessments, we've already spoke about. We need to think about EWIS, which is the electrical wiring interconnection systems, applicable to your scale and size of organization, if applicable. Fuel tank safety, again, groups one and two, as applicable. And then there's a requirement for the structural integrity program, again, as required, if applicable. Uh, compliance monitoring training. So those people involved in compliance monitoring, they need to go through some form of training because the approach and the way to do quality or compliance, I should say, is slightly different. It's you need to move away from what I mean by like a, a tick box approach. You need to be able to demonstrate things more, demonstrate how effective things are, maybe look at statistics and data and so on. It's just not a form of standard sort of yes, no, yes, no. We have to move away from that now. And then also, we now have to implement what we call like a two yearly continuation training program. So that is the main sort of changes. So that's it, really. I'll just give you a, a brief snapshot of the main significant changes and the difference between the part M regulation and the part CAMEL. If you have any sort of questions, or would like to know more, then please call us on the telephone number shown on the screen, or you can email us at sales at blue-altitude.com, or you can go to our website and again hit the contact us page and then just enter your comments and send it to us. Otherwise, we'll post this again, this little video on YouTube. If you have any sort of questions, then do enter the question at the bottom of the feedback, and we'll be gladly help you to try and explain or help you understand what we just tried to describe in this video. Thank you for your time. Have a good day. Bye-bye.